Hello and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by Jeanette Linford. Good afternoon, Jeanette. Afternoon, Pete. Great or to be here. Well, I say sorry. I should say morning for you because we're both we're both morning time. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> where are you dialing in from today? Well, I'm over in sunny Mallorca. So I'm very lucky to be over here for a couple of months. Yeah. Well, I said. So you, you have a split life, do you, between the UK and Mallorca? Uh, not not directly, actually. I mean, I live in London with uh, my partner Chris, but uh, because our businesses are set up in a certain way, we can pretty much London wherever we want to be. So we just thought, actually, why not have a you know a bit of time over here? We were going here, coming here for a month originally, and then we've extended it a couple of times. So they didn't quite fancy uh, going back to quarantine. So um, yeah, we're just running the businesses from over here. So yeah, it's cool. Well, that's that's like the the dream lifestyle, isn't it? You know, people <laughs> people aspire for what you have. <laughs> Well, you know, you've got to visualise it, haven't you, and then make it happen. It hasn't always been like that, Pete, trust me. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, tell us, Jeanette, who are you, what do you do, and where are you from? Great stuff. So, uh, so yes, I'm Jeanette Linfoot. You can probably tell from my dulcet tones that I'm a northerner. I'm from Manchester, born and bred. Um, so, yeah, I, I uh, started out life up north, uh, the youngest of three daughters. Um, very sort of normal, working class family, if you like. Um, you know, my mum and dad, house full of love, didn't have a lot of money, but my mum um, actually reassured me that was because she actually spent most of the money on giving us great childhood and experiences, which included a caravan in the Lake District and a, a couple of overseas holidays. So we, we, weren't too hard, we weren't too hard done by, let's put it that way, but very much a great sort of work ethic from my parents, if you like. So, so yes, grew up in Manchester, um, went to university in Leeds, uh, the only one in my family to go to university. So that was quite an interesting time for me. I did an economics degree. Mm. Does that Came make you the first. smartest in the family? Well, you know, <laughs> I think it was, well, it was back then when they were just uh, competing against probably two sisters, although they're both smart in their own way. I was the more academic one, let's put it that way. But no, my nieces and nephews, they're, uh, they're, pretty, they're pretty smart now. So I think I've been overtaken by my eldest nephew and uh, my, my eldest niece as well. <laughs> oh, fabulous. I love yeah. it. What, what sort of background did your mother and father? Oh, so well, yeah, again, they both were from Manchester originally. Mm -hmm. My dad was actually born in Moss Side, which is um, a very well, now it was quite a rough, really rough part uh, of Manchester. But back then it was sort of, you know, typical Coronation Street type area. You know, everyone would sit on their front porch, you know, because there was only a backyard and have a cup of tea and gossip with the neighbours and you could leave the door open. But yeah, so my dad, my dad uh, was a plumber. Uh, my dad passed away eight years ago. So gosh, I miss him terribly, actually, even now every day, you know, I always think about my dad. Uh, but yeah, he was a plumber, worked for the gas board uh, for many years. And then my mum, she was a secretary, but she was very entrepreneurial, my mum. You know, so I remember growing up as a kid and, you know, my, my mum would sort of have a She'd say, oh, I'm just going to have a, I'm just going to go in and get a market stall. So, you know, I remember w working on the market with my mum and, and then she went and bought a hardware store. Didn't tell my dad, just went and bought it because she was, <laughs> you know, she was kind of like that. Um, so, so my mum was always quite entrepreneurial, actually. Uh, and she, my mum's still, still alive. She's 83 and doing really well. So it's fantastic. But yeah, I was, I was taught from a very young age, you know, work hard, um, treat people with respect, you know, those sort of really, really strong values um, stay with me uh, and still, still to this day, really. I, was, I had a happy childhood, that's for sure. So who do you take after then? I'm a bit of both, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah, a bit of both. I would say my dad was very much an extrovert. You know, he'd be the first on to the karaoke, that kind of thing, you know, embarrassing dad dancing, lots of that going on. So I'm, I, from being out there, I'm probably a bit, a bit more like my dad uh, in terms of being sort of quite extrovert. But probably more like my mum on in terms of business and, you know, that kind of things, I would say. So I can see both of them in me. Lovely. So you were like the perfect third child and they stopped at you. <laughs> I don't know if I was the perfect, but I think it was an accident, Pete, actually. But, <laughs> you know, here I, there I was. So, you know, I'm here now. You've got to put up with me. But, um, yeah. You were, no, you were I, destined. You were meant to happen. <laughs> Well, I definitely um, had the easier ride compared to my elder sisters, that's for sure. I think my mum and dad were quite chilled out by the time I came along, so yeah. <laughs> we're going to get you in real trouble with your sisters here, you know, so. <laughs> oh, I love it. So tell me, what, what does fire in the belly mean to you? Well, I think it's about 
following a passion and you know when you really feel something and it, it literally that you know it, it's in your gut and I think it's being tenacious it's around following your dreams it's about having a passion for something and and having the drive determination and focus to to follow that dream and to you know whatever whether that's in a personal scenario or business or life you know I think that fire in the belly where you're, you're excited you're nervous you're, you know, you're kind of full of potential. For me, it's, it's, there's a lot of things in there, but it's, it's all around passion, energy, and making things happen, I would say. And is that something you feel you have? In bucket loads. I, that, seriously, that I, I, I'm really lucky because I guess I've always loved what I've done, you know. Um, I mean, of course you have good days and bad days, don't you, in, any, in business and in life, but generally speaking, I've always followed a path that I've really enjoyed and I, I really find it's congruent with my values, you know. So I was 25 years in the travel industry, which is a fantastic industry. And, you know, in the travel industry, you, you work incredibly hard. You will not find a more difficult trading business than a, than a travel business because the margins are so thin. But by God, it's a lot of fun. You meet some incredible characters but it's not a nine to five, you know, you, you are traveling a lot, you know, so the lines between your personal life and your work life are very blurred. Um, mm. But it's an industry that, you know, I mean, who doesn't like holidays? You're, you're changing people's lives, you know, um, literally. And of course, you're giving a huge amount back to local economies. It's global. You know, you're affected by every single thing that you can think of from a macroeconomic perspective. So it's incredibly challenging, but it's an industry that I absolutely love. So I spent most of my career in the travel industry for that reason. And then what I'm doing now, you know, I'm absolutely adoring the property business we have, the mentoring that I do with my mentee clients. I genuinely care. Um, and I'm really enjoying, you know, I still work in the travel industry on mergers and acquisitions. But again, I work with really cool people that have um, aligned values, I guess, really is important. So yeah, I've, I've, uh, I think I live and breathe the fire in the belly. I'm quite feisty as well, you know, so I, uh, in a good way, not in a fighting way. <laughs> I would never have guessed you that, honestly. It's like, so hit us with that shopping list of what you do there. So we have property business, we have a mentor business, we have uh, the travel consultants, what do you call it? Advisory, yeah, Advisor. mergers and acquisitions, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's quite um, a collection. Yeah, it is. It is. And you know what? I love the variety and the freedom and the flexibility. You know, and I came out of the corporate world about two years ago, just over. And um, in my last role, I was the CEO of the travel division for Saga, which is a, a big organization. I had four businesses, you know, so I mean, at the turnover I was responsible for then was sort of about 370 million. You know, we used to make 25 million EBITDA, 1,700 people on the team. You know, so it was quite a big, a big corporate role. And when I came out, um, I just wanted to take a bit of time to decide what I was going to do, really. And sort of the, the, what happened was I started getting approached a lot by private equity houses, because in my previous role, when I was at two years managing director of the emerging markets, where I ran businesses, all that, ran and bought businesses in Russia, China, India, all sorts of places, um, I'd done a lot of M&A, mergers and acquisitions. So when I came out of the corporate, a lot of private equity clients, you know, approached me and said, listen, we're looking at buying business A, and business B. Yeah. Would you work with us on the deal? Um, and because I've run businesses, I know what good looks like in, in that space. So that sort of was the first business, if you like, that I set up on my own outside of the corporate world. But it was sort of an adjacency. It was a natural transition, if you, if you like. Sure. Um, so I still do that now, um, but on top of that, I now have our property business, my mentoring business, and my podcast, which I've recently launched, as you, as you know, Pete. So Give yeah. us a shout out, the podcast name. So it's Brave, Bold, Brilliant. That's the podcast, and it's all about how we've all got greatness within us, and we can all achieve our full potential, but in order to do so, you do have to be brave and push yourself out there. You need to make an impact and, and be bold in what you do. And of course, when the stars align, you know, everything's brilliant. But it is quite an interesting collection because I'm sort of fascinated by, you know, this interplay between corporate and entrepreneurial as mm -hmm. well. And, um, you know, so the idea is that the podcast is I'll be interviewing interesting um, people who are at the top of their game. And it's almost from the corporate 
boardroom tables of big international businesses where obviously I have a lot of my network and contacts and that's the world I was in to the you know the dining room tables of entrepreneurial startups which is kind of where I'm closer to now and everything in between um so yeah it's it's it's, uh, it's cool I'm enjoying it really good sounds like it's a bit of a guilty pleasure for you then to to get talking to all these people and find out their their passions yeah you know I mean it is it is genuinely because I'm just fascinated by how, you know, how people overcome challenges, how they create opportunities, what are the sort of the mindset that, that helps people get to those positions, you know, how do you approach failure? So I'm just genuinely interested and fascinated by the whole topic, really. And, you know, when you talk to someone very often, well, you'll know yourself from, the, from your podcast, you, you bring things come out that, that probably would never, ever be sort of aired, if you like, or discussed. And that's really fascinating. And ultimately, that's helping other people who are listening because, you know, people go, gosh, I never knew that. Or, oh, I suffer from that. Yeah, that makes sense now. Or, oh, I've never thought of that for my business. That's a great idea. I'm going to apply that to, to my world, you know. So I think it genuinely helps people to be able to listen to a range of different experiences. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, it, it is cathartic in the process as well. And as you say, it's sharing ideas and visions and goals. You know, it's, it's, it really seems to help. So, yeah, so take us right back then, young Jeanette. What were we looking at? <laughs> okay, so you were looking at you were looking at um, the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. So I guess really, when I look back, um, you know, to my childhood, I, an incredibly happy childhood. You know, for sure, my mum and dad were were brilliant. But you know, I guess I was always the the little one. You know, jumping up, going, "Look at me! I want the attention!" You know, so I'd be the the first on the dance floor, on the you know, and all that kind of stuff. Almost sort of a bit of a show off, I suppose. Really, um, quite a tomboy as well. You know, I'd be climbing trees and doing God knows what. So I was always sort of a happy kid. I think really, always quite out there, and you know, really enjoyed enjoyed time with my um, my sisters. Because of the age difference, though, so I, my middle sister, Andrea, she's five years older than me, but my elder sister, Alison, is eight years older than me. So, you know, if you think about it, by the time, you know, my elder sister met her husband quite young, so sort of by the time she was 16, you know, she was sort of off out dating and all the rest of it, and I was, I was eight, you know, mm. so I guess I had quite a period of time where I was not exactly an only child, but I had a lot of time with my mum and dad, I guess, on my own because my elder sisters were off doing their things as, as you are when you've got an age difference. So that was quite nice because it did mean that I got sort of quite special time with mum and dad on my own as well. Um, so, yeah, so it was it was cool. But, uh, yeah, I just have very happy memories of, of being a kid, really. Uh, lots of fun, lots of energy. We had a, caravan up in the Lake District when we were kids, you know, from me being about four. Um, so lots of fun times, walking and things like that, you know. Uh, so it's good. Yeah, life was life was nice for me as a kid. It sounds like the Lake District was a bit of a go-to spot for you guys, was it? Well, it was because it's not that far from Manchester. And mm. my mum, my, I think my mum would have liked to have moved to the Lake District, uh, but my dad never wanted to do that. I think he probably just he liked to visit, but not to live, you know, and, and if yeah. you, you know, if you live it out, and if you're a, if you're a bit of a city person, which I think, you know, my dad was, and I am as well, actually, um, it's beautiful to go to, to somewhere like the lakes, but it's not necessarily a place where you'd want to kind of grow up, you know, I think there was lots of, lots of kids on recreational drugs up there, because we were so bored living in some tiny little village with nothing going on, and good fun, you know, so it's like an hour, drive from Manchester so yeah you know most weekends we'd be we'd be up there but of course when my mum and dad bought a caravan way back then you know there wasn't even any electricity in the little village where it was so it was all gas mantles and no running water you know so it was all it was like posh camping really I suppose <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it yeah so come here how was how was school for you then yeah interesting actually yeah you know I'm a bit of a geek I was always a bit of a girly swat so I liked school you know, I really, I, my, I never had to be nagged to do my homework by my mum and dad, you know, I always, and maybe that comes from the wanting, you know, to, to do well and get the approval and, you know, well done kind of thing. But I enjoyed school, um, you know, and I, I remember, well, in, in Manchester, they still have what's called, you know, the 11 plus, mm. where, you know, at 11, you take um, an exam and if you pass, you go to the grammar school and if you fail, you go to the local comprehensive. 
Um, so, so I passed, um, I, as did my elder sister, but my middle sister didn't actually. So she went to the local camp comp and uh, myself and my elder sister went to the grammar school. And uh, yeah, so I, I was, I was, I, I guess, reasonably academic and, and um, I didn't find school difficult from, from a sort of a work point of view. And, you know, I mean, even now I've still got friends of mine from school who are still my best friends today, you know, from sort of being the age of 11. And I think that says a lot, you know, that I worked hard, but I also had a really nice group of friends, you know, and in particular as a teenager growing up in Manchester, you know, at that time, the whole Manchester music scene was exploding, you know, so the Happy Mondays, Stone Roses, In Spiral Carp, it's all, the, you know, the Smiths. I mean, it was a real hotbed of musical talent. And at that time, I'd have been 15, 16, you know, so starting going out to pubs and stuff, which obviously, yeah, mm -hmm. underage thinking, not good. <laughs> but, you know, speaking of it, get off into Manchester to go clubbing on a Friday night or to go to the Hacienda, which was like the club to go to. So it was a great time, you know, it was a, it was a really fun time. Um, and as I say, some of my, my friends, you know, from my being 11, but then age 14, the boys joined the girls' grammar school. So they amalgamated the two grammar schools. So the boys arrived, much greater anticipation and excitement from the girls. And then all these spotty, smelly boys turned up, you know, it was a bit disappointing after that. <laughs> But some of those spotty, smelly boys are still some of my best friends today. <laughs> so, so we had a really good group of friends, you know. Um, yeah, it was cool. I enjoyed school. I enjoyed school. It was, it was fun. What, was, what was your go-to subjects then? Well, I sort of mass economics. I loved economics yeah. um, and actually ended up doing my degree in economics. So I, I guess I was new, but I loved English literature. You know, I did English literature at A-level, you know, got, got, got three A's in my A-level. So I was, as I say, I was a bit of a girly geek. Um, but yeah, so I, I would say I was probably more airing, even at an early age, towards more maths and economics. Science wasn't really my, my thing, you know, that, that just didn't rock my boat at all. Um, so I was more, more English, maths, economics, statistics, that kind of Kind of area yeah. do you know why what sort of led it that way um, I, don't know. I think i was probably just quite good at it you know i like mm. the creativeness of, of english mm. you know and the sort of the inspiration um of sort of i don't know reading shakespeare or whatever you know whatever the novel you were you were studying to kill a mockingbird i think was a go-to wasn't it there back mm. then stuff like that um so i quite like the creativeness of that but then i i guess i like the the groundedness of numbers and business and I just had a great economics teacher Mr Watkins it's funny isn't it when you look back and think about people that have influenced you in your life mentors or coaches or whatever and he was probably an early an early mentor in a way you know so I, I liked him as a teacher mm. I was quite good at languages as well actually I did French and Spanish um and I got A's at GCSE and all that but I, I've, I've not kept up my languages that's one of my regrets actually but um, yeah, I think I just liked the teacher, liked the subject, was quite good at it, and therefore just continued down that vein. Um, and I think there's a few lessons in there, isn't it? You know, people, I'll always say, try and do something you love, because you're probably quite good at it, if you like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very true, because you get the response, don't you? You know, you sort of, you're good at it, you, you do well, you're happy with that, and, and so the, it, it continues to spiral on. Yeah, and you build momentum, don't you? I think mm. it, it does tend to sort of snowball, as you say. You know, and, and actually for me, you know, when I went to uni and I did my economics degree, uh, which I came out with the first, I was very pleased with that. Um, but I didn't really know what, I knew I wanted to go into business, but I didn't really know what. And it was general enough to kind of be applied quite well. Um, and, and it certainly stood me in good stead. You know, I mean, my first job actually out of university was as a, as a government economist in Whitehall. So I actually worked in the government economic service for a couple of years, advising ministers on pensions policy of all things. Um, but I jumped out of that into travel because I don't think the, the grey suits of the car, uh, cardigans of the civil service weren't really congruent with my personality, shall we say. <laughs> I've just offended anyone that's listening that works in the civil service. It's, it's a great, it's a great career, honestly. <laughs> It's true. It's it's. I think the civil service is either four year. It's not, you know. And I think anyone sort of of the of the entrepreneur blood in them, I think it's probably just to exit them out the back door as quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
exactly, exactly. But it was a good start. It was a good first job. But when okay. I graduated in '93, you know, there's a big recession on, and mm. I remember, oh my gosh, applying for hundreds of jobs, not just a few, hundreds. And even though I had a great degree, you know, I just wasn't getting any. I wasn't getting any proper jobs. And I remember moving back to Manchester very briefly after uni. And, um, you know, you just do what you do, you need to do to make some money, don't you? You know, so I mean, I remember I was waitressing at Old Trafford Cricket Ground, I was working in a bar, um, I had another restaurant job waitressing. I used to deliver the post at Kellogg's in the office, you know, with a little trolley, go around delivering the post. I was wiping tables in Debenhams, you know, I just had all these like shitty little jobs. Um, but I never wanted to be, I knew my parents had, had to make sacrifices you know financially for me to be able to go to university um and being the only one that did i kind of felt that weight of responsibility you know so there was no way i was going to be going back home and then living off my parents you know i did anything i could to earn some money um, and then eventually i got offered i got offered um, a job as i say in the government economic service down in whitehall so i slightly reluctantly moved to London, being a northerner. I said, I'll give it two years, two, three years max. 25 years later, I'm still, I'm still in London. <laughs> oh, I love it. So yeah. take us back. So what, what was the first job then and how much were you paid? Oh, the first, my first job was working in a chip shop. But it had a calf as well. It was a chip shop, but it had like a cafe bit to it. And okay. I got paid eight pound a day. And I would, on a Saturday, I would start at oh, sort of eight in the morning and I'd finish at seven and I got eight pounds, eight pounds a day. And I got in there because my dad <laughs> played snooker <laughs> with the guy that owned the chippy and my sister had worked there before me. <laughs> so <laughs> it was, uh, that was my first job. And uh, yeah, so I'd, at the end of the shift, you know, on a Saturday, and you'd have the lovely nylon kind of dress and the tabard, you know, the apron over the top of it. And I'd get home, my God, the stink of, you know, chip fat. One spark, I'd have gone up like a Roman <laughs> candle, Pete, you know, seriously. <laughs> but it teaches you, you know, good lessons, doesn't it? You know, hard work, you just do what you need to do. And it was a lot of fun. You know, actually looking back, it was a lot of fun because you'd get all the old boys coming in, you know, and they'd have their habit, you have your regulars, you have this little chat with them. And, you know, so it wasn't bad. It was quite a fun thing to do. And I didn't know any different, did I? You know, so for me, eight pounds was eight pounds, right? I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it amazing? That's the thing. Because those days you haven't a whole lot to spend it on. So you're like, oh God, uh, you know, I'm going to be rich. You know, it's yeah. it's amazing. But I mean, you're you're sub sub a pound an hour. I can't I can't quite work it out. But you're there, yeah. eighty or ninety p an hour. So it's um. Not, but at the same time, as you say, the the morals and the ethics and the the environment and and the social interaction it teaches you so much. Yeah. But even my parents, you know, when we had pocket money, we never got it just for free. You know, mm. we had to do something, a pound a week pocket money. You know, I'd normally have to do the ironing or clean the car or whatever it was, you know. Um, so, so yeah, that again, or we got an extra pound actually, because my dad used to uh, like give us a pound to go down to Woolworths to buy um, a seven inch record every week. So that was like a treat. So I really got two pound but one was dedicated to a seven inch um, seven inch vinyl <laughs> that's, yeah. that's great you know it's great experiences to go away and do that yeah yeah a lot of fun <laughs> so then into university so you went to leeds university study I did. yeah yeah i did i did and that, yeah i mean just a fa just a fabulous time really. i mean you know i look back now and i i just think gosh you know at that age 18 you think you know it all don't you you know you think you're so grown up and this that and the other and looking back you think oh well that's quite a big thing really isn't it to, to leave home at 18 and go off and you know so obviously the academic side of it is great because you're learning um you know for me i was i was i was doing something i enjoyed you know my choice of topic i loved as i said so that helped I did economics and management studies, actually. So I sort of had a broader business bit to it yeah. as well. Um, but also, it's the first time you're managing your own money, really, isn't it? A budget, you know, you're away from home, you've got to do your wash and all that kind of stuff. So I think it teaches you some really good life skills. Um, and again, you know, some of my best friends, you know, are, are friends that I made at university. Um, so it was a great. I definitely, definitely burnt the candle both ends. You know, I... <laughs> I worked hard, but I really played hard as well. 
Um, you know, so sometimes we'd be out, you know, I mean, you go, go clubbing like three or four nights a week. I mean, how does that even happen? If I, if I have a late night now, it takes me like a week to recover. <laughs> yeah. but, but back then you just got a lot more energy, haven't you? You know, you go out with your tenner, you know, and it's pound a pint. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was great. And Leeds was a good fit for me because I could have gone to Oxford or Cambridge with my grades. I could, have, I could have gone to one of those two universities and I looked at them. And, I, and I, probably people would say, God, aren't you mad? Why did you not go to Oxford or Cambridge if you had the chance? But I just knew it wasn't the right fit for me. Yeah. You know, I, I just wouldn't have felt, maybe this comes back to a bit of the old imposter syndrome, you know, sort of thinking that you're not good enough to be there and you don't fit in. So maybe there's, there was an element of that. But I chose Leeds because it was great for economics, actually, which is what I wanted to read. And I just really enjoyed the whole setup. You know, it felt much more real to me. Mm. Um, you know, moving from Manchester to Leeds, you know, two northern cities. Uh, so it was perfect, absolutely perfect. So I don't regret my choice at all. And actually, when I joined the economics, government economics service, when I went down to Whitehall, 80% of the intake were Oxbridge. You know, and there I was with my northern accent and I'd done my, my degree from Leeds, you know. And there was nothing wrong with that. But in my head, I was sort of, I, I guess I had a bit of those wobbles of, oh gosh, you know, everyone else is Oxbridge. And I, I didn't, I went to Leeds, even though I came out with a first. Um, so I guess that must have influenced my choice, Pete, in the early days, actually mm. thinking about what's the right fit for me. And I made the right choice. I absolutely made the right decision um, because it brought the best out in me, you know, that environment. I'll never know what the alternative would have been had I gone to Oxford or Cambridge, of course, but actually I, I don't have any regrets, not for a second. Um, so that's, that's what you want, isn't it? You don't have too many regrets in life, do you really? Absolutely. I think, I mean, that it's, it's incredibly wise for you to do what you wanted to do as opposed to, you know, the, the dumb thing is, well, you have an opening to go to these universities, then of course you must, you know, and you're like, mm. well, that doesn't necessarily make it right, you know, and, no. I was I was curious, you know, because you were saying there, do, do you get a bit of, you know, from, do, do, you, do you get something out of slightly being the underdog? Do you sort of fight your corner yeah. a bit? Yeah, probably, actually. I've not thought of it that way. But yes, yeah, I think you're right, you know, and, and certainly I think when I moved down south, you know, and everyone talked with quite a posh accent, I thought they were really posh. And it would almost make me be more northern. <laughs> you're stubborn you know <laughs> so maybe maybe there's an element of you know northern girl done good um that i i, I kind of somehow feels quite uh, a sense of justice around it maybe a sense of fairness you know that no matter what your background is no matter what your you know um family situation or financial position has been that everyone deserves a chance everyone can follow their dreams so it's probably linked to that a sense of fairness and justice mm. uh, um, and that's something that I think you know I guess that's also a theme in, in my podcast around you know if you look at some very successful people in business life you know arts whatever field a lot of them come from quite humble beginnings and have really created something quite amazing and special not, no, it's not always that way, you know, and, and neither is better or worse, it's just different. But I think you have maybe a more quite a grounded perspective when you are a bit of the underdog because you have had to work hard. Things haven't been given to you. It hasn't been easy. You, know, you have had to sort of challenge yourself probably in a different way than if you come from a more affluent background. I'm, as I say, I'm not saying it's better or worse, but that's just my experience. Mm. And I think that's helped me. And it's also helped me, I think, be empathetic more empathetic with people you know I think I can adapt my style more because as you got a bit older with a bit of experience you, you learn how to present yourself in a way that's slightly more formalized shall we say you know if you're presenting to I don't know business case to the board or you know I'm talking to a government minister or whatever it is like over time you can position yourself in the correct way in way to communicate but if you come from more humble beginnings, I think you can also have an affinity with the cleaner or with whoever's the pot washer in the kitchen and you can have a, you know, a good rapport. And that's helped me, I would say, in my life in business, being able to kind of span the whole spectrum of, of people because now everyone's got value, haven't they? Everyone deserves respect. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably, yeah, maybe I like being the underdog. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's interesting because even, as you say, some people really need the contrast at, as a comparison for them. You're saying, here's where I came from or here's where I could be. Here's yeah. where I am today. And for some, the lower the, lower the low, that equals the higher the high. You know, and it's it's actually one spurs the other. Um, yeah, and I wasn't low of low. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, we mm. I had a great childhood, and you know, we had a very good. You know, my parents worked hard. We weren't on the breadline by any mm. stretch, but we didn't come from money. You know, mm. we didn't have a lot spare. And as uh, my mum said the other day to me, actually, she said, "Gosh, you know, you know, I'm listening to some of the podcasts and." you kind of people are going to think that we were really poor and we didn't have anything i'm saying well no mum that's not the case but relatively to other people we we probably we probably were relatively but my mum mom says to me yes but Jeanette, when you and when your dad and i worked hard which they absolutely did i mean gosh grafters both of them you know she said we had to decide do we save the money we earn and we had our own house and everything you know so we always had to have a house and stuff or do we spend it? And she said, and I spoke to your dad a few times and he said, let's, let's make great memories for, for the girls. And I mm -hmm. thought that was lovely, you know, cause that, it's a different perspective, isn't it? Um, but she was obviously concerned that maybe she, she thought I was presenting us as some kind of <laughs> terrible, terrible family that didn't look after the kids. And it's not that case at all, you know? So I'm certainly, uh, I'm certainly very lucky starting life. <laughs> I love that. And, and it's even, I mean, what's, what's come clear very quickly and is you just have a hunger and a thirst and a drive in you, you know, no matter what, you know, yeah. and is that, is that just something you've always had? Yeah, I think, I think so. And it, and it probably comes from what, you know, I think it does, it, it does come from childhood and, and your upbringing. I think the, the work ethic was definitely instilled in me from my parents for sure. And I think the, the idea that you can achieve anything probably came from my mum, you know, because she was quite brave with a lot of the things that she did, you know, even though her main job was a secretary, you know, the fact that she, you know, she went and just went and bought a, a hardware sh shop just because she wanted to do it. It's quite unusual, you know, back then, you know, my mum was, um, still is actually, she was a great violinist. So when my mum met my dad, she was in an orchestra. And so she traveled all over the country and stuff playing in the orchestra. So she's quite feisty, my mum, you know, in, in a way, but she's very quiet, so quietly spoken. You know, you wouldn't think that, that she was that, that sort of um, fire in the belly type person, but she absolutely is. So I think I learned a lot of that, you know, you can achieve anything you want, actually, if you set your mind to it, comes from her. And I guess the third aspect was this, I suppose needing to be loved and approved of and you know the recognition good girl good girl you've done well you've got an a again you know and i think that has definitely sort of drive drove me on but the key there's a flip side to that because i mean a lot of people talk about imposter syndrome and i think it's a common thing you know it's something that i explore a lot with my mentee clients actually but i think you have to recognize where it comes from because it can be debilitating if you let that take over you know, you can find that sometimes it could hold you back. It can stop you from, from taking the right course of action because your insecurities kick in and you just have to kind of observe that, understand where it comes from and go, actually, I am good enough. I am good at what I do. I deserve a, a, you know, a place at the table. I can do this and just reframe it a little bit. And I think that's what I've worked quite hard on over the years. You know, I'm very proud of where I'm from. I understand where some of these feelings come from and why I, I react the way that I do from my, in my gut sometimes. But your gut isn't always right if it's coming from the wrong motivation, you know? <laughs> so it's just trying to get that right balance. But, um, but yeah, those are definitely factors, I think, that have spurred me on to be successful, to always give it a go. Don't, don't worry too much, just try your best and see what happens, you know? It is always a fine line, isn't it? Especially through teenage years and all that, that you get praised for doing something well or, you know, yeah. passing or, but yeah, there's a fine line, not tipping it over that actually, you know, I must do this. And, and as you say, then you, you just create a, an impossible target for yourself. Mm, yeah. And, and I think it's important to celebrate the wins along the way, isn't it? And that's mm. something that I've not been great at, I have to say, over the years. Chris, my other half, is always saying, you know, it's great to, it's great that you're ambitious. It's great you're always pushing on to be better and do more and be a better person and build the business, but enjoy the ride as well. 
don't miss the journey. Um, so I, it's something that I'm getting better at, um, but I still have to work at it because my natural, my natural drive is mm. what next, what next? Okay, I've done that, move on, what's next? And actually it's important to just celebrate, even if it's a small win, just sit there with a cup of tea and a ginger nut, you know, say I've had a good day today. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be the big, big things. It can be the small triumphs. Um, so yeah, I've had to work at that because my natural drive is push on, push on. Yeah. Mm. I was going to, do you take time out for gratitude, for goals, for, for self-reflecting? You know, I'm not yeah, sure. yeah, I do. I do actually. And, but again, that's probably something that I would say I've done more since I've probably been in my forties. Um, I think in my earlier career, I was quite ambitious and I always knew I wanted and roughly where I wanted to go. But you're so busy in the moment and taking the opportunities and building your career and climbing the ladder, whatever, you know, whatever it is. That I don't think I sat down and had a life plan when I was in my 20s. I know I didn't. And I probably didn't really in my 30s. I was more in the moment. And yes, I'd sort of have a next goal in mind. I didn't really say, well, why am I here? What's my purpose? What legacy do I want to leave? Whereas those are questions that I definitely ask myself a lot more in the last five years, I would say. So yeah, I try very hard at some point of every day, so in the morning in particular, just to have a bit of time in silence, you know, think about what it is that I'm really aiming for. And then spend a bit of time visualizing that. I'm all, I always have a plan, always have a business plan. But you don't always have a life plan, do you? So it's important mm. for both, I think. Ah. Can, yeah. can I ask what age you are? I'm 48. 48. And it's interesting, as you're saying, even in the last five years, you've sort of taken time out. So early mm. 40s, you, you've just, it seems, it's shifted gear. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you know, in my early 40s, I'd become, well, died then, I was already. So I was a managing director of the emerging markets for TUI. So I, you know, bought, ran businesses, travel businesses in Russia, um, India, China, Brazil, so I had a big international team. I reported directly into the group CEO of, of TUI, a gentleman called Peter Long. But I was very often, or not always, but very often, the, either the only woman in the boardroom or one of two with a profit and loss account. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's the difference, like being on the hook for the numbers and running a business in its entirety. So, you know, I was, I was full on. I was absolutely full on. I mean, I, I could be away 50% of the time. You know, my commute, my weekly commute sometimes would be to Beijing. I'd leave on a Monday morning. I'd do a 12-hour flight, eight-hour time difference. I'd come back on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, you know, and I'd have my team in Beijing. And, I'd, and then, you know, the following week, I'd go into Delhi or I'd then be flying out to Sao Paulo. So I spent a lot of time away. Um, so I was full on. Um, and, and, you know, I'd, I'd worked hard to get to that position, you know, of being the MD of a big business and international with the cultural diversity, a lot happening. It's high energy, high paced, quite exhausting. Um, and then I left to and I joined Saga where I was a CEO, again, a full, full business is so quite a scale business. So you're on the hook for, you know, all of the operational day to day trading, deliver the numbers as well as, you know, shaping the future, the strategy, etc. So it's quite intense. And when you're in those intense moments, you quite honestly, you probably don't really give yourself enough space and time to think mm. about what do you want longer term as an individual. So it was only really when I came out of that corporate life um, where I just thought, actually, I just want to take a bit of time. You know, so I did a lot of traveling. Chris and I, gosh, I think that first year, so 2000 and... Mm, 18 this would be um, and I think we were away for seven months of the year you know we don't have kids so it's 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 easy for us to do that but we, you know we went to Thailand for a month we then went backpacking around South America proper backpacking for three months uh, we went diving in the Philippines for a month you know it was a fabulous year um, and then I was still doing some work on the uh, mergers and acquisitions side throughout that year but it was really giving myself some headspace and time that I then thought, actually, this is what I want now in this next phase. You know, I want more flexibility in my life. I, I want to have my own businesses. Uh, I want to probably be a bit more entrepreneurial. I want to have multiple streams of income. I want to be able to decide, okay, let's uh, stay in Mallorca for another month. 
if we want, you know. So to, to create that was quite a shift. You know, from being in a in a big corporate organisation where you are, you've got massive responsibility, and you were in the spotlight. You know, you really are, especially when it's a li- all those businesses are listed. So you know, if you're in a FTSE 100 or a FTSE 250 business, you know, I would be on, you know, presenting to the in- the investors, the city, essentially mm-hmm. the analysts. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a different different animal completely. Not 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 worse, just different. And I had a great time in my career. But I'm really enjoying the variety and the flexibility. And I think if anyone has an opportunity at whatever point of their life to just step back, reflect and think about what you want next and what's important long term. What do you want written on your gravestone? You know, these are some quite big questions that you never think about when you're in your you know, 20s. So you just don't. Rarely anyway, I never do. So, yes, yeah, so it's quite nice to sort of give yourself that headspace, I think. Mm. it's do, do you did you thrive in that sort of you know very corporate environment and were you in your sweet spot or were you slightly overperforming um no I, I thrived yeah I enjoyed it I like the energy um mm. and I, I think I also <laughs> big coming back to the stubbornness <laughs> I also I knew I had the capability even though I'd have the audit wobble and imposter syndrome oh, I'm a good enough I'm a good Deep down, I wanted to be a strong female business leader in a large corporate organization. Because I'd only known corporate, but I, I've seen so few role models, Pete. You know, there are, there are women in, in very senior roles, but it's shamefully low. You know, the FTSE 100 companies, there are six female CEOs, 6%. It's, it's crazy, you know, it really is. So I, I have got a bit of a bugbear about that because I just think it's not about men or women being better or worse. You know, this isn't a man bashing thing at yeah. all, but it's about saying we, we are different, but we bring different things to the party. And there's absolutely no reason whether you're female, gay, straight, black, white, that you shouldn't be able to be in a very senior role in any organization, you know, so that again, it comes back to the probably that, that sense of fairness as well. Yeah. So I guess for me in my corporate life, I always had that aspiration to sort of be up there, to be a role model for other women, to deliver a great job for the business, to do the right thing for the customers and my team. So because all of that, and it was an industry I loved, you know, and I still love. So, you know, I was in, I was in the, the perfect space at the perfect time. Hmm. Um, but now I'm, I'm in a different place, which I'm equally enjoying. It's sure. just different. Um, you know, and in your mid-40s, I think you become a lot more aware of your mortality and thinking, you know, Chris is 10 years older than me as well. Not that, you know, that's a, that's a factor because he's a pretty young, <laughs> young, young mentally <laughs> um, and physically as well. But it is a factor. Of course it is because... You, you know you've still got the energy, still got the fire in the belly, coming back mm-hmm. to the name of the podcast, but you're conscious that the next 10 to 20 years are kind of pretty, you know, you're not going to necessarily have the same energy in your 70s as you have in your 50s. Mm. Um, you're not necessarily going to want to do that stuff. So there's sort of a period, a sweet spot, I think, of your sort of mid-40s, almost to sort of 60, where I think you, it's the perfect time. Mm. to do whatever in life you want to do because you've got the life experience you've got the business experience you're much more comfortable in your own shoes you know what you want you know so so actually i think it's it, these are the halcyon halcyon time for me mm. but i loved my corporate life i loved the people i worked with but was it tough god yes were that did everything go right no of course it didn't did i learn a lot yes stacks you know but uh, I feel very proud that I, I think I left my mark in a, in a good way, you know, and I've still got, you know, lots of friends in the industry. I've got a great network, you know, and, and um, I think I treat people in the way that I like to be treated myself um, in business. So, yeah, all of that you take with you, don't you? You don't, you don't lose it all. You just, you just evolve into whatever's next. Um, so, yeah, I, it was cool. I enjoyed it. What was your style as a as a manager, or as you know, in, in your your work ethic? Um, I would. I mean, it, it sounds a bit cliche to be honest. What I'll say now, but firm, firm but fair. 
you know, I mean, I would always, I, I'm big on um, honest, and it sounds obvious, this stuff, but I don't like political game playing. Hmm. You can get a lot of that in, in the corporate world. You just can. Well, in any organisation, actually, not just corporate, any organisation. There's always politics everywhere, isn't there? Sure. Yeah, that's normal. But I don't like game playing. I don't like, you know, people manoeuvring behind the background and sort of saying one thing and doing something, being disingenuous. So for me, I'm a very straight person. What you see is what you get with me. I'm high energy. I, I love what I do. I always want to aim for the moon, you know, always. So I'm, I'm demanding. I expect a lot of my teams, um, but I'm very fair. You know, and I will always support. I would never ask anyone on my team to do anything that I either haven't already done myself or that I'm prepared to do now. You know, so, so I'm not up there as a, you know, sort of sitting in an ivory tower, um, but I expect a lot. I am quite, quite demanding on, on standards and, and everyone giving their best. We can't always win, but at least try. Give it your best. And, and I very much like sort of positive minded people that will come up with solutions. You know, I don't want to hear the 10 reasons why it's not possible. Just give me two or three ideas that we can actually make it work, you know? So I'm, I'm very much around fairness, but I'm, I'm, I do expect quite a lot as well because I expect a lot of myself. That's probably where that comes from. You know? mm. But by default, are you, a, are you a spender or a saver? Where do you set? Oh, Oh, that's a good question. I would say historically I was probably a saver, which I think comes from, from probably family background, you know, make sure mm. you have, a, have, have, have something put away for a rainy day. I think now I'm, I'm much more an investor to create wealth and then enjoy the spoils of that wealth. You know what I mean? What's the point? What's the point in having, you know, being the richest person in the cemetery? But you've got to get the balance, haven't you? Now, so I, so I would say I'm I've probably I, I've definitely I'm much more of an investor than a saver. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you put your capital to good use to create passive income or future, um, you know, growth in key result areas, all that kind of stuff, or new businesses? But do enjoy it as well. Spend a bit. But don't spend it all. <laughs> I was going to say the, the economics degrees is bound to, it's, it's, it's where it sits with all that you know it's yeah you know that's uh it's, it's always interesting to see you know people's risk profile yeah but I'm, I'm all about um I suppose putting capital to good use hmm. to create growth I'm a growth person you know I, all the businesses that I've been have either been turnaround transformation or it's been expanding into new international markets or it's been mergers and acquisitions you know i'm all about growth you know even in my corporate life i was never one just to tick over mm. you know just to sort of it that's just not me and i guess that comes from the ambition the drive and always wanting to do better to be the best we can be and then to do that you have to invest as well you can't do it just on a shoestring you know so it's just trying to get that right balance isn't it I mean, and then overall, would you say, are you pain driven or pleasure driven? Ooh, I'm probably pleasure driven. Yeah, I'm probably pleasure driven. It's, it's a difficult question, Pete. Well, no, it's interesting because, you know, as you say, you, you enjoy the challenge, you know, it's, it's, it's the, uh, it's, it's the firefighter, you yeah, know, it's, you, can, you come into the challenge. So. I was, I was, maybe I, was, I am more pain driven maybe I am I'm a bit sadistic actually and you know I'm always on to the next thing but I think I think you know it's it's neither one or the other is it you know I would probably historically be more pain driven thinking hmm. about it you know I'd always be pushing you know what next what, what next and I'm still doing that but as I've got a bit older and a bit wiser um I also think it's important to enjoy the journey it's important to celebrate the wins you know, I'm not frivolous. I'm not out there, you know, spending loads of money. Spend a bit, you know, and also be kind to the people around you. You know, I like to, I like to give, you know, if I, I get no greater pleasure than, you know, buying my, my nieces and nephews something or helping them, you know, if they're struggling in a certain way. I, I like to give um, whenever I can. I do a lot for charity. So, yeah. I don't know, maybe maybe helping others is it's not spending in a traditional way. Yeah. Interesting though. Never thought of that.
Who's your, who's your go-to on charities? Um, I do a lot for cancer research um, uh, and motor neuron disease. Unfortunately, I lost one of my really good friends uh, to motor neuron disease two years ago. My friend, one of my best friends from school. She was only 46. You know, mm. so it's, it's a horrible, horrible disease. But yeah, cancer, motor neuron disease and uh, Alzheimer's, stroke dementia. Because I think that those those areas are well. One is a personal aspect to, to me with the motor neuron disease, but then I just think dementia, Alzheimer's is such a horrific disease that actually affects so many people, and you know it's a really high proportion that of people in the future are likely to suffer with that. So those are probably my three my three go tos. Hmm. Yeah. And in terms of legacy, are you are you at that stage in your life where you? Well, yeah, the legacy, the legacy for me is, is I've got, my sisters have been very fertile. So whilst I don't have children, uh, Chris and I don't have children, my sisters kept that side of the, you know, the genetic line very, very well sorted. Thank you very much. So I'm a, I'm a brilliant auntie. I love being an auntie. I adore, I adore my niece and nephew. So I've got five nephews, two nieces, two great nephews and a great niece. So I'm, I'm cracking it on, right? Um, so yeah, for me, the legacy is because we don't have our, you know, part of what building the property business is one to create a lifestyle that's, that's going to be great for Chris and I, but it's also to leave something for the niece, my nieces and nephews, mm. you know, um, so that's the legacy for me. And it took me a while to sort of think about that because, you know, and, and this might resonate to some of the listeners, maybe women that don't have children. Um, because the natural thing, when, when someone says to you, what's your legacy? For, for people that have children, it's obviously their kids. Mm. And if you don't have kids, it, it can sometimes make them, oh my God, you know, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Because I'm not, I'm not continuing the family in the, you know, in the way that my sisters did. But for me, so the legacy is my nieces and nephews. But then the other side of that is I firmly believe, and I've got a thing about, uh, every woman and girl being able to fulfill their potential um, because I think there's so many you know seven bit over seven billion people in this world half of them are women but if you look at certain areas of society or developing countries you know women that don't have the same opportunities even in the western world I mean we're talking about you know being on the board and, and things like that you know as a woman it, it can be more tricky and this isn't woe is us but I think my long-term legacy as well, as well as the family side of things, would be to help as many women achieve their potential in life as, as possible. So I've got a long-term vision where, and it's just an idea at the moment, I'd love to longer term be able to afford to have some kind of foundation which almost connects business women in the Western world with small cottage industries in developing countries, whether that's in Africa or Asia, um, because then you're helping the source, you know, and I did something, a development program when I was at TUI actually, and I went out to Thailand, it was about 10 of us went, and part of it was a leadership development program, but the other side of it was helping a local business on the ground. Um, and this business, the one that I went into, made banana products, Okay, it was a tiny little village. There were about 200 people in the village. No running water, no school, you know, no kids didn't have shoes. They lived in, in wooden shacks, right, in this place. But the, the leader, the female leader of the village had a banana business and they made banana chips, banana cake, um, you know, handbags out of banana, you know, dried banana skins and this kind of thing. And honestly, it was one of the most meaningful things that I have done because to help her, you know, and how she could bring the, her product to market, you know, to, to bring more money in that therefore meant they could get running water in that village. And it just stayed with me. So I guess I've got this sort of idea in my mind about how cool would that be to, to do something like that, that globally makes more of an impact. And how fulfilling is someone from the Western world to be able to, to do that? So it's a, it's a real win-win, you know, on both sides. So I guess that's the, the other side of the legacy that I've got in my mind. It's, it's longer term though, Pete, obviously, but it's there as an idea at the moment. 
Absolutely. Well, listen, that's what it's all about. You know, your C-type goal and put it out there, you know. Just looping back a bit, I mean, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned 6% of, you know, female CEOs are in exact positions. Yeah. What's, what's your take on that? Why, why has that happened or why is it that case? Well, that's, I mean, that's in FTSE 100 companies. So those are in the big listed companies. Um, you know, and what you tend to find in, <clears throat> in the entrepreneurial world, it's different. The numbers are different. There are more mm. women. <clears throat> you know, in the property world where we are, you tend to find quite a lot more um, female property investors because it fits around flexibility of kind of, you know, childcare, et cetera, right? But in the corporate world, I mean, there's, there's never just one thing going on. And there are certain organizations that are fantastic at it, but it comes down to a couple of things, I think. One, um, the sort of the, the practical policies and things that the business necessarily doesn't have it as a strategic agenda. And, and it shouldn't be, I'm not a big believer in quotas and things like that. I think it should be the best person for the job, genuinely. However, you, you have to feed the pipeline, you know, and if mm. what tends to happen, I mean, it's certainly in the travel industry, it's very, you know, I, you know travel industry is 65% female, because if you think about the sector, you know, you've got travel agents that tend to be more, more female, you've got cabin crew, you know, tend to be more female. So as a proportion at, at lower levels, it's a much higher female industry, actually. But then it drops off a cliff when it gets to sort of middle management and then it drop, continues to drop off a cliff, you know, senior management, director, and then CEO. So, and, and the reason really is, is a couple of things. One, I think the policies don't, aren't necessarily conducive, you know, so they don't have flexible working necessarily. They don't allow things like job share, mm. um, you know, travel, you need, you need to travel. So there's a sort of a, you know, an inherent, uh, it's more difficult, isn't it, for women if you've got childcare arrangements to all of a sudden have to be away for two weeks, you know, where you're, you're going doing business in whichever part of the world. So that is just sort of, you can't really do a lot about that, to be honest, that aspect. Um, and then, but I also think there's a, it's a lack of role models, you know. So if all, if when you look at any organisation, whatever, in whatever sector, if all you see are white middle class, no disrespect, white middle class men. Mm. So if you're a woman, if you're black, if you're gay, you know, all the different diversity aspects of society are not represented, right? So then you think, well, hang on a minute, I can't see anyone that looks like me. I don't know that this is possible for me in this organization. So, but then you, you have to build the pipeline, you know, you have to have policy, recruitment policies, um, career development plans, targets, if, you know, if that's the thing that you want. I'm, as I say, I'm not a big believer in quotas, but you can have other metrics that, that show that you're on track. Um, you know, and I think it takes time um, and role models play a really big part. I think having it as a strategic a, a, a agenda and it's proven diverse boards financially perform significantly better than non-diverse boards. So this isn't just about, oh, it's a nice thing to do and oh, let's, 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 you know, do well, do right by the women. Aren't we good? This is actually a commercial choice and that's what it should be. It should be a business decision. So there's a whole bunch of factors. And then I think there's, there's things that women don't help themselves if we're talking about gender diversity. You know, sometimes, you know, our mindset's not set. You know, men and women think differently. You know, I, it's again there's so many studies on this Pete. i could go on for hours but you know a woman would look at a job description and there might be say 20 30 percent that maybe she's not had direct experience of and she won't even apply you know she'll go oh, i can't she'll look at that bit the gap and go whereas a guy i'm stereotyping a bit but a guy will look at it and go oh well, i can do 70 percent of it i'll just give it a go i'm not worried about the 30 percent. i'll apply anyway so men tend to hold their hand up and keep their hand up until they get noticed <laughs> <laughs> you know, and things like going in to negotiate your package and remuneration, tends, men tend to be better at it than women. I'm not, I, I am generalised. It's not, it's not always the case, but it's more of a natural skill. So women have to sort of learn to be a bit stronger in some of those areas or to support each other as well. And the organisation needs to be more empathetic to that. You know, so it's, it's a fascinating area. But as I say, commercially, it's proven diverse boards perform better. Businesses that have diverse boards, and you know, and that's not just um, gender diverse. Any diversity, you know. I mean, EasyJet's a great example actually, because EasyJet, you know, if you think about um, captains, 
very aviation very very male dominated sector anyway in terms of aviation and um, pilots in particular you know i mean a few years ago you'd be god you'd be 98 percent men uh, whereas easyjet they made a strategic decision to say no we want to attract female pilots and they set a target i think it was 20 percent by 2020 and they started at something like four percent probably five six years ago but they made a conscious decision and they've, they've, they've overachieved that target now because it was a strategic priority. It was set at the board. It was backed by the CEO and they had a whole bunch of initiatives to, to achieve that. And how great is that? Because one, the female pilots are just as good as male pilots. They're great and um, do a great job. And it also means you're opening up a bigger talent pool, you know, because people go, women go, oh God, yeah, that's, that could be a career for me. EasyJet go into schools and they talk to girls and boys that if you want to be a pilot, this could be a career choice for you. You know, so it's things like that that make mm. the difference, really, I would say. But yeah, I don't know. I, I've never walked around with a chip on my shoulder about it. It's something I'm passionate about. Mm. But I also kind of believe, you know, if you walk into a room thinking there's going to be a problem because you're a woman or whatever, because you're black or because you're gay or because whatever, there probably will be a problem because you've got it in your mind whereas if you just say i'm going to do the best i can i'm going to be congruent with my values i'm going to do what i say i'm going to do i'm going to deliver the results i'm going to speak with honesty integrity and everything to do with that and nine times out of ten that will stand you in good stead you know and you'll do a good job and you'll be recognized for it so it's a it's a, it's a complex area isn't it talk to me about mindset say again Pete. talk to me about mindset Oh, it's everything, isn't it? Absolutely everything. I, I'm, a, I'm a massive believer that you, if you work on the inside out, work on yourself, work on your mind, um, then the, it will be reflected in your outside results or life you know, tangibles in, in, in the outside um, part of your, of your world. So, you know, for me, I think it's around getting rid of the limiting self-beliefs, you know, whatever they are. I think it's, you know, it's proven, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever come across Ryan Pinnock, um, but, you know, Ryan, if you ever listen to any of his stuff, and I think it's, again, it's baked in science, this, but, you know, your, the way you respond as an adult is pretty much formed from the ages of zero to seven. Mm. Um, and I, I do believe that. And that's not about having a good childhood, a bad childhood. It's just that those values that are quite entrenched in your or behaviours, maybe attitude to money, and money doesn't grow on trees money doesn't buy you happiness well how do you know you haven't got any <laughs> you know but but some of those perceptions are formed at very early age aren't they and they mm. stay with you um and i think sometimes that's sometimes that's great because those values can really drive you forward you know we're talking about me and the drive to want to succeed and be better has definitely helped me that's been a positive in my life but the imposter syndrome side of feeling not good enough. One, it can make you not feel great. It can hold you back and it can stop you in your tracks. So you have to be able to sort of recognize when is it useful and when is it debilitating and when am I actually limiting myself because of that mindset? Um, so I think mindset is at the heart of absolutely everything. It's, it's everything in life, not just in business, career, relationships. I mean, I, I see it time and time again, you know, where... People don't have happy relationships, happy personal relationships. You know, they almost reject love, you know, and, and that's probably because they don't think they deserve to be loved. So therefore they attract the kind of men or the kind of women to them, you know, that therefore are not going to give them love. You know, so it's, it, it's the whole big thing around if you believe, believe you, you're certain, a certain way, then you probably will be. You know, those who say they can and those who say they can't are both usually right. Um, I think that was Confucius, wasn't it? Or um, yeah, or... Confucius. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I really believe that. And it's interesting because if I mean I listen to a lot of podcasts and I read a lot, a lot of a lot of development books. I always get something out of those things because mm. I'm very open minded. I always want to improve. I want to be a better version of myself. Um, you know, so if you listen to say Tony Robbins. I, I love Tony Robbins. I know he's a bit kind of out there, a bit American and stuff. And I, I never used to like him, but once I started listening to him a bit more, I thought, oh, I actually quite like this guy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but he talks a lot about, you know, if you, whatever you tell yourself, you will become. 
you know so if you say someone someone's a smoker oh well i'm a smoker oh i've always smoked i can't give up smoking oh well I, of course i am a smoker they try and get the chances are they're not going to give up smoking because they've told themselves they're a smoker i'm a smoker i'm a smoker you know so even at, even at that kind of level whatever it is or you know oh i'm big boned trying to lose weight oh i'm big boned but you know i'm big boned no you're just fat <laughs> you know <laughs> you know so if you say to yourself no i am going to be fit and healthy and i am gonna you know i am that person then you will become that person so i'm a massive believer in the power of mindset i think it's absolutely everything to be honest and it's probably something that if you think about the education system mm. it's not really talked about is it it's the same as you know financial education in schools is atrocious we don't teach our kids how to manage money how to budget or, or financial now so that's just not taught is it you're taught pure maths and you know and there's a place for that but there are certain life skills i think and and probably how to deal with your mindset i don't think i came across any of that stuff until i was probably in my 30s and now i listen to those kind of things all the time because i recognize just how critical it is and i, I mean i spend a lot of time with my mentee clients where i work with people on a one-to-one -one, and i tell you nine times out of ten nine times out of ten there is some mindset stuff going on very often imposter syndrome all that kind of thing um and it's yeah it can be really debilitating can't it um but if you embrace it you recognize it and you work on it um then it, it you know it's it can be so powerful as well i think absolutely it's uh, who's your who's your go-to then in terms of, i mean you mentioned tony robbins who else is sort of in the top of the charts for you um i like the yeah, tony robbins is definitely up there he's a bit of a guru isn't he um i like mel robbins as well mm -hmm. she's second cool. row and yeah. yeah, five seconds. I mean, that's so simple, isn't it? I love it. You know, if, you, if you're suffering from any inactivity, for those that don't know, Mel Robbins uh, has a very simple concept. I mean, there's a lot more to her than this. But essentially, if you're struggling to take action, whatever it might be, or make a decision, get out of bed in the morning is the classic one. You literally count backwards from five. You don't count upwards because you can keep counting upwards. But, you know, you go five, four, three, two, one. <sighs> take a deep breath. Get out of bed galvanize or whatever it is make a decision but it's so useful isn't it um just that little tool so i, I quite like mel, mel robbins as well she's really she's really cool but you just get inspiration from reading i love reading mm. um, and i read a whole combination of business books mentoring books me a personal development books and there's just so much out there you know something like um uh oh god old classic i mean there's all the law of attraction and the secret and all those kind of things but there's the there's a good book actually. I don't know if you've read it, Pete, called The Power of Now. Mm -hmm. um, Neville Goddard. Eckhart Tolle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and basically, again, that's simple. There's two there's two main takeouts for me from that book. One is about enjoy the ride, enjoy the now, which is what we were talking about earlier, which I'm not very good at doing. I've got to be better at that. Um, and the other one is that just if you're in any situation, it does not matter what the situation is. It could be personal, it could be business, it could be career, anything. You only ever have three choices. That's it. There are only ever three choices. One is you try and change the situation. Two is if you can't change it, you get out. Or the third is if you can't get out or you don't want to get out and you can't change it, then you have to accept it. But don't keep moaning about it. <laughs> accept it and get on with it. And so I love that simplicity. You know, if you see you read all this stuff and you might only take one big thing away. Um, but I try to, you know, I get a lot of inspiration from those kind of things. So podcasts, listening to people, reading. Um, yeah, there's, 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 uh, there's so much to learn, isn't there, from everyone. Yeah, it's cool. Absolutely. What, what is your learning style in general? Oh, gosh, I am a massive scribbler. So I'm very thorough. I'm a, I'm a, I would never, even if I'm reading a book and I hate it, I cannot finish it. I cannot not finish it. I have to finish. That's a geek in me, right? That's me. I'm doing a thorough job. I've been told to read it. I'm doing it, you know, <laughs> and I'll see it through to the end. I never not, never not finish a book, even if I'm not reading it. Even fiction, if I'm not even enjoying it, I'll still finish it. So I'm definitely very thorough. But when I, if I read a, a business book or a, a mindset book or personal or whatever it is, like I'm learning something, I will always take notes. Always. I mean, I was I was re rereading actually at the moment and um, Stephen Covey 
uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm rereading it, right? And I've got it here with me. So I'm there. I have my, my sort of hardback sort of note, notebook, which uh, the first half of it will be all like what I'm going on, doing business and stuff and whatever. But the second, the back half of the book, if I'm reading something, I will always take scribble down notes because what it sticks in my mind better by doing that and two you know if I'm sat on the tube or whatever and I'll be looking through my notebook sometimes I just have a quick flick through and I, and I can see a couple of notes of a book I've read and I think oh I have just reminded myself of that mm. so that tends to be my <laughs> my style but I've definitely got into podcasts a lot more I'm not saying that because we're on a podcast now and I've got my own but I've got into podcasts I would say probably the last two or three years um, and I love the efficiency of it so I'll listen to podcasts. Whereas in the gym, I used to listen to music all the time. Mm. Now, I, nine times out of 10, I will listen to a podcast. So you're training, you've been inspired, you're learning something all at the same time, aren't you? I can't write stuff down. That's the only disadvantage of that. But yeah, so it's a combination of, li- of listening, reading and, and note, note taking. Do you need silence or are you plenty of noise or what's, what's no, your... No, I, si- I need silence. Yeah, which is really annoying, actually, because if I'm in the moment, I'm reading something and Chris comes bowling in, making a cup of coffee, I'll be like, off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I need I need silence. Yeah, definitely. To be in the moment, fully concentrated. I get I do. I, you know, I get distracted by that. Uh, you know, I, I like to be quiet. And if we were to look at your notebook, are we going to see straight lines? Are we going to see scattered? Are we seeing different color pens? What, what do we give us a picture? You are, you are going to see really neat notes now my handwriting is a bit of a scroll but you know it's going to be small handwriting i try and get fit as much on the page as possible i will do a couple of diagrams maybe now and then you know something like that but no i'm i'm, I'm more i don't know i guess i replicate what's in the book but in shortened version of the things that sort of stick out for me and then i'll always if there's an action i'll always put an arrow if it's something i need to do personally i'll put a little, I'll put a little arrow and then i know that i need to I need to put that into action myself I love that little little index for yourself is to uh, calls for action or questions or queries or whatever. I'm a complete geek. I told you. I mean, I, you know, shamelessly admit. <laughs> mm, listen, whatever works. Exactly. Um, talk to me about role models. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, I, massively important. I, you know, I'm a massive believer that role models make all the difference. Um, you know, you think about it, my early role models, my parents, right? Because they're, you know, probably for most people. Mm. Um, and I think, I think role models, mentors, coaches, you know, that they do different things, but uh, all really critical. And I think with role models, um, in particular, if you feel like you're in a minority group or a situation where there's not many people that look like you that are in a position that you would like to get to, role models can really give you the confidence, the reassurance, and if you've got someone where you've got a great relationship with that person, it's not just that you can visually see them and a sort of a, you know, a casual role model without a relationship. If you can engage with those kind of people, those role models can very easily turn into mentors, can't they, or into coaches. Um, and that's always really helped me. And it's not always women, you know, it's often, it's often men, you know, it's whoever resonates with you. But if you can sort of surround yourself with the right people. And I know we all talk about this a lot, but it does make a massive difference. And to be inspired, I mean, I interviewed for the first interview I did on my podcast, I interviewed a lady called Chris Brown, OBE. Chris Brown was the CEO of EasyJet. She was the MD of the airline at TUI. We've known each other since, gosh, 2006 when we worked together. And she'd become a great friend. But my God, I admire that woman so much. You know, to, from what she's achieved to come from, she comes from Straban actually, which you'll 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 know very well. She think she said to me, "God, it's the most heavenly bond." It's just she grew up there during the troubles. One of seven kids, incredibly, incredibly poor family and difficult situation, and she knew that she had to. The only way she was going to get out of that was by educating by education. And then she, you know, to what she achieved in aviation, which is a very male dominated sector, to be a woman, a woman running an airline, you know, I mean, unheard of, you know, so I personally, even though we're, you know, we're sort of, we were colleagues and we, we're now friends, um, to see what she's achieved and how she's approached it and the respect that she has and 
how she'd negotiate with the pilots, with Balpa, which is a very difficult thing to do on, on you know, whole trade relations stuff. And to be such an iconic, but very true to her values and, her, and herself, she's a fantastic role model for me. You know, and I, I, I take a lot from, from, from what Chris has achieved and what therefore I, has helped me with my career. So I think examples like that are, are amazing, aren't they? But role models come in all shapes and forms. There is no one size fits all. It's whatever resonates with you, I think. And in, in your career, have you have you um, followed, you know, have you used mentors? You know, I know obviously you, you've sort of almost come a full circle now and you are a mentor. But yeah, is that yeah. something that's been active through your career? Yeah, massive, massive. Mentors and coaches, actually. I mean, they do different things. Right? Mm. A coach is a, is a trained professional coach. Uh, mentors is much more around your learning from someone from their sort of life and business experience, really. They've maybe trod a similar path to you. So they do different things. But yeah, I, always, I have at quite a few points of my career. I would say um, particular points where I've either, I've been at a point of transition, um, you know, where I've, I'll give you an example, actually. So when I was at TUI and I got promoted to become the managing director of the emerging markets. And at that point, I was then, my reporting line changed. So I was reporting to the group CEO, Peter Long, who was the, obviously the top of the tree. And Jackie Simmons, who was the HR director at the time, she said to me, Jeanette, it's great you've got the promotion. Um, Peter can be quite tricky, you know, and he's, he's quite an alpha male, you know, as a sort of a gen generation. You know, Peter's probably, gosh, he must be in his 70s now, you know, so he was mm. sort of 20 years, 20 years, 15, 20 years older than me. And quite a traditional alpha male. I mean, amazing guy, actually. Loved working with him. But she said to me, you know, I think it'll be great for you to have a coach at this point because at this particular juncture, and I'd had, you know, in previous times, but that point was, was quite important because I was now, I was the MD, I was on the board, mm -hmm. I was reporting into the group CEO, I had a big international business with multiple different businesses, different cultures, a big team to manage. So it was, a, it was quite a, a jump um, and that helped me, that definitely helped me transition. Uh, and there's been other points in my career. You know, at the moment, you know, I'm, we're being mentored by Rob Moore and Mark Homer, as you know, for our property business. So totally different space, totally different point in our journey and career and business life. Hugely helpful, hugely mm. helpful to have to have that. So yeah, and, and as I say, I mentor people now. I mean, I've mentored people for a long time, but I mentor them in a more formal capacity now. And, and I love it. I, you know, as a mentor, I love being able to genuinely help that person and see them flourish and see there's nothing nicer than seeing, you know, someone really, really live their dreams and, and get help them with getting rid of those blockers or whatever it might be. But it's definitely made a massive difference to me. So anyone that's um, in a situation where they're either transitioning or they really want to progress or maybe they're just sort of having a bit of a wobble um you know which can happen can't it you know we all have those every now and then uh, i think to get yourself a mentor or a coach um and pick someone that chemistry is good because that's you know that has to be the fundamental uh, but it will it can transform i think your life and your business or your career or whatever yeah definitely and then also you know i mean i've had lots of informal mentors you know one of my old bosses when i first started um going into the emerging markets my old boss richard prosser he approached me and said hey listen Jeanette, i'd been the product director at first choice so i'd, I'd had a big functional kind of role mm -hmm. and then um, two had decided two had merged with first choice two of the big companies travel companies and richard approached me and said how do you fancy we're going into the emerging markets the first market is russia how do you fancy going to russia buying some businesses running them and just sorting it all out bit left field I was like oh right okay yeah well, you know we'll give it a go why not <laughs> hopefully no one's gonna die here I'm just doing the best I can yeah <laughs> and that was such a pivotal point in my again it was a real pivotal moment in my career because it totally pushed me out of my comfort zone you know I'd never done any corporate finance mergers and acquisitions etc um and but but the point being but at that, that point, Richard was my boss, you know, and I had huge respect for him and really enjoyed working with him. But he, he saw something in me that I probably didn't see in myself at the time. And he, you know, approached me for that role. I did the role. I, I then ultimately, when he left the organization, I got, you know, I got promoted to his job. So he was such a, an instrumental person. 
And now he's become a mentor to me. You know, I have so much respect for Richard and he's helped me in so many ways. It's not a formal mentoring relationship. He's, he's an old boss, old, but you know, an ex-boss. Um, he's, he's almost become a friend, I would say now over the, you know, I'm talking 15 years, yeah, 15 years, no, probably 10 years later after the event of all of this. And um, yeah, I just, it's great. So mentors can come in all shapes and forms really, I think, but some of them are long relationships, some of them are short, you know, but definitely massive. How, how does somebody get the best out of you then? Um, for me, I, I like to have the support, you know, and, and someone there with my back, but I do like to get on with stuff. Okay. You know, if someone's going to micromanage me, that drives me a bit crazy because I, I think you get to a certain point where, you know, if you're in a certain position, you're there because you actually can do the job, I think. Um, so what I really relish is being having a, a bit of a, di a direction and a shared vision as to where we're heading. Sure. You know, I'll always want to make sure we've got that clear and then give me, give me the reins and but always be there when I need to maybe run something by you because I won't go all the time. Do you know what I mean? I won't be going back and saying, oh, I'm not sure about this, that and the other. I'm very confident making the decisions that I need to make. But equally, if, so if I am coming back to ask for some support or to bounce something around, it's because I, I feel I need to, but that won't be the norm. You know, that, that's sort of when it's important and, and is necessary. So I think for me having it's that freedom and flexibility to get on and run the run the team and run you know run the business is important but at the same time know that you've got someone there that's supporting you has got your back um when you need to run things by or just bounce some ideas around so that i really enjoy um and that you know i quite like to have you know like all of us it probably comes back to to my childhood of wanting to be liked and approved of you know i do quite like getting positive feedback i don't mm. need it all the time you know, because I think you you have the positive feedback because you're in a certain position in the first place and you're, you've been paid whatever you're being paid, you know, you're remunerated. That's the, that's the recognition, actually. That's the thanks. But it is quite nice for me every now and then to someone to say, oh, yeah, you've done a good job there, Jeanette. I really appreciate that, you know. And I don't mind being called out if they think, you know, I'm very happy equally to be, you know, someone to say, oh, actually, I think you could have done that better. I'm good with that as well. Yeah. How is your ego? I think it used to be a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think when I, I think when you're younger, um, and certainly, maybe this partly comes from the corporate as well. You know, that, that you're normally defined by your seniority, the role, the brand, size of your PL, how much revenue you're bringing in, how big's the team, all that kind of stuff. So I would say when I was younger, in my sort of thirties, probably even early forties, I was much more ego driven around some of that stuff um now i'd say i'm more measured i think I, i'm more comfortable in my own shoes i've got to a point in my life and career where i don't actually have to prove anything to anyone you know i've 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 got to the top of my game in in the travel industry could i have gone further yes of course i could have gone to you know into bigger businesses etc you can always go further can't you but i feel really pleased with where i got to and my you know the level i've got to so now i i, I don't need that sort of external recognition as much mm. and much more comfortable um, in my own shoes because I don't feel I've got this, anything to prove to anyone. But it was interesting because when I came out of the corporate world, my, at that time, I thought I would go and do another CEO role of a corporate travel business. And there were things, you know, roles were coming my way. And, and some of them, I just, I, I, there was a couple where I nearly took them. I nearly took the role. Deep down in my heart, I just thought, not quite, it's not quite the right thing to do. Mm. But I had to push my ego to one side because I guess maybe at that point I was worried about, well, what's everyone going to say? Where's Jeanette going to turn up next? Oh my God, she's left Saga. Which business is she going to go and run? And, and I was probably more concerned in that first half of that year of 2018, you know, thinking about, what everyone else is thinking. And the reality is no one cares. No one gives a shit. You're really not that important. <laughs> you know, seriously. So you do have to kind of get over yourself a bit and go, you know, 
<laughs> you know, the queen is dead, long live the queen. That, that, that's how it is in reality, yeah. <laughs> you know. And it doesn't take away all of the good stuff you've done. Um, but you, it, is, it is a bit like that. Uh, and I think uh, you have to yeah, put your ego to one side. So I've, I've got better at it, Pete, but I would say I was probably quite ego driven. Not in a materialistic way, never in a sort of all oh, the car I drive or, mm. you know, I like my handbags, don't get me wrong, but I was never sort of overly ostentatious and, and materialistic and using material things to prove that I was doing all right in life. That was never my bag. It was more around the position and the impact I was making. I think that's because I always want to make a mark, you know, sure. and leave an impact. That's probably what's driven. But yeah, ego, ego can, um, can be a bit of a, bit of a terrorist can't it sometimes it is interesting because you mentioned ryan panic there from super genius you know mm. that that's that's a it's a very clever i suppose is maybe the right word to put it you know it's a clever workshop and format to actually sort of talk to your chimp and uh yeah. well I, I say chimp i mean we, we all have different yeah. views on it to the uh what do you call it steve peters the, the chimp paradox i find particularly useful yes. analogy yeah you know, definitely and I think, I think also it probably comes from um, an adjustment. If you spend more time in the corporate world where it is more structured and it is more hierarchical and you are, there is much more um, emphasis on job titles, progression, promotion, you know, that, that's the way it is. I think if you come from that background, that's mainly, it's what you know more of. If you started out life as an entrepreneur, you're probably measuring your success in different ways. You mm. probably don't care so much about job title. It's more around how much money you've made. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, um, so I think it's, it's, it's just a different, a different world really. But yeah, you definitely need to, we don't have to, I mean, but it can, it can blow you off track. I think if you're overly, overly concerned about what everyone else is thinking about you and your ego, what really matters is what's inside and what do you, people that are close to you your loved ones think about you that's that's the main thing isn't it really did you i mean through all that did you were you able to balance sort of personal uh, development and growth with the business development growth because obviously in the corporate world it is all encompassing i mean it it takes your life your blood your soul the whole thing which is great i've, I've had 10 years in the corporate world in london and I wouldn't change it for the world. I also wouldn't go back for the world. So it's 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 both it's it's both sides of it, and I'm you know I'm kind of curious how you balance. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was de there's definitely an emphasis on the business mm. um, more than the personal development and personal life actually mm. as well, not just personal development. You know, because in particular, you know, the roles that I've done, I've always been away a lot, and and you know that does take quite a sacrifice in terms of your personal personal situations, relationships with partners and family and what have you. But I'd say, yeah, so definitely more focused on the business. Mm. And I think that also comes with a bit of maturity because as you get a little bit older and a bit more sort of long in the tooth, you do realise that even if you're very well respected with what you do and you're doing a good job and the business is doing well, all of a sudden there can be a change and sometimes your face doesn't fit anymore. You know, and, and, and so you, you are, it's not that you're a number as such, but I've seen a lot where people have absolutely given their all for the business. And then, you know, CEOs changed or recession has come along and all of a sudden 30 years, 40 years in a business and they're gone, they're out. And then they're totally lost, yeah. totally lost. And the damage to their ego, self-worth, self-belief, all of these things, because they've just put so much in and sacrificed everything else that then they're like, they're a bit screwed, really. You know, so I think as, as you get a bit more wiser to it, it's not that you don't give your all, you know, and do a good job, but I think you're much more realistic and measured about the role that you play and yes do the right thing for the business but also make sure that it's doing the right thing for you as an individual and for your family so you know you don't work for the company you actually work for yourself mm. your family and your loved ones yes you're employed by the business but it's different and i think if you can have that sort of more pragmatic view of the world one you you do make sure you do continue to, to develop yourself 
Mm. Um, but at the same time, when something changes, you know, you're much more equipped to deal with change and, you know, to be much more uh, well networked externally, for example. Um, so I, I, I think for me, yeah, I definitely have an emphasis on the business, but because I used to do a lot of long haul flying, you know, I had lots of time in the air and this was before you got Wi-Fi on, on flights really and stuff. So it was quite, it was the perfect time. It was quite self-indulgent, just time for me. So I would do a lot of reading, you know, of course I do some work and then I watch a film and I might have a glass of wine and, you know, then I'll do some reading and then I'll, you get into quite a habit of when you're going to sleep and all, you know, because yeah. you, you manage your jet lag, you get into your little routine, you get 12 hour flight to Beijing, you know, that, I'd know what I was going to do on that 12 hours. So I guess I was quite lucky because I had that time um, in a way. So obviously sacrifice sleep, right? Um, but, but I did do quite a lot of self-development. And then the TUI in particular, well, TUI and Saga, actually, the last two big corporates I was in, they were quite, they were very good at investing in the senior leadership team. So, you know, I, the, the programme I was explaining to you before, you know, about going over to Thailand, I mean, that was all funded by TUI. You know, that was such a great experience. You know, I, I went to the, um, the Institute of Management Development at Lausanne, you know, and did, did two, two no, three weeks of residential, which is a really expensive thing to do, mm. personal development. So, it, you know, it's not all that you don't do stuff. The corporate can be really supportive and, and certainly to he was. Um, but yeah, I think it's more sometimes a sacrifice you make for your personal life. And you've got to watch out for that a little bit. Uh, when you're in those really fast roles that just totally take everything. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it's getting, it's, it is getting that healthy balance, which yeah. sometimes you get and sometimes you don't, right? Yeah. And I think it's coming back to, you know, obviously we touched on the power of now. I think it's about being fully present in whichever moment you're in, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I see this quite a lot with working mums actually as well, where that, you know, they've got, they've got big careers. I mean, I'm full of admiration for working mums. I really am. But sometimes what can happen is when they're in work, they're kind of worried about, oh, my God, I'm, being a, I'm not being a good mother. You know, I've got to stay an extra hour or whatever. Mm. And then when they're at home, they're thinking, oh, shit, I've not finished that report. And, you know, so that they, they kind of beat themselves up about trying to get this perfect balance. And it doesn't really exist, does it? So I, I think there's something about trying to compartmentalise your time. You know, I always fiercely protected my weekends you know, there would be the odd thing. I mean, in travel, things can happen. You know, I mean, I was there dealing with 9-11 when that happened. I had aircraft all over the world, et cetera, and I had to get people back. And are my customers safe? Are they, are they a casualty? You know, you know, I've dealt with repatriations of hurricanes, shootings, all sorts of stuff. So there were things that will happen, which mean, obviously, you just have to jump on it, right? Sure. Uh, but generally, I would always protect my weekends uh, because I knew I gave so much during the week that... I needed two days, really, as much mm. as at least one day where it was dedicated to Chris and I or to my family or whatever. So I think if you can try and compartmentalise like that, even if you work very long, long days, find that time that's just for you or for you and your family. Yeah. What, what sort of mantra do you work to? Or do you... Um, I think I'd probably work hard, play hard is, is, is right for me. And that's probably... Mm that's sort of been throughout my life I do tend to uh, candle both ends I need a bit more sleep now well I tend to get up early I go to bed early and I get up early but um yeah I think what I think nothing comes for nothing in this life you have to put the effort in and it's probably not work hard I mean that's the it's probably work smart isn't it but you get the general gist you know I do believe that you you know if you're going to make things happen you have to take action you know, and that's sometimes people talk a great talk, but they never actually take the action. So you have to work hard, but enjoy it as well, you know, mm. and, and value. And this might come from, you know, I think when you, when you, when you lose loved ones as well, it's a real wake up call. You know, I mean, my dad passed away eight years ago and, you know, it was such a shock. He was so healthy and stuff. And it was a massive shock. And it's not a day goes by, but definitely... Things like that definitely make you reassess. You know, as I say, mm. my friend Jane, she passed away from motor neuron disease two years, just about a year and a half ago. And she, you know, she's 46, she left two kids. You know, and you think, wow, I mean, that is just bloody unlucky. You know, there's mm. nothing she, she could have done. But my God, does that make you think differently? Does that make you realise that actually what's important in life? So I think, I think for me, yeah, work hard, play hard, I would say. Mm. 
Was your, your dad's passing, was that unexpected? Yeah, he had a stroke. Yeah, a really, yeah. really bad stroke, really severe. And, and, you know, he was so fit. I mean, my dad, you know, he was, gosh, he was 79 when he had his stroke. And but he was so healthy, Pete. He was still working. He was a plumber. He was, you know, up the ladders, decorating a neighbor's house outside. You know, he was so fit and healthy. Um, so, of course, you know, I was, I, I look back and think, gosh, wasn't I lucky to have had my dad all those years? You know, of course I was, and the happy memories and all of the rest of it. But it just still felt very unfair because he just, you know, it was one of those. And it's just a horrible, it was a horrible year. You know, he was very, uh, incapacitated, couldn't speak, you know, mm. couldn't really move. And it was just a, a living death for him and, and also awful for all of us, you know. So, yeah, when things like that happen, it definitely makes you think, mm, what's important here? Life is short. None of us know how long we're going to have. So, you know, live your dreams. Don't have any regrets, you know, and, and, and just really try and enjoy every moment. I mean, a bit philosophical, aren't we here? But... I do, I do firmly believe that. I think when you're younger, you don't think of things in that. It's not about all doom and gloom mm. and all morbid, but it is a bit of a, it's a bit of a reality check. And also, I think when you get to, you know, we talked about being in our forty. Well, I'm not sure how you are, how old you are, Pete, but um, you look younger than me, kid. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm just just turned forty, so yeah. Exactly. Well, you're just in the forty club. Good yeah. for you. Um, but no, seriously, when you sort of get into that sort of 40s, 50s, I think that is one of the reasons why you, you, you are aware of your mortality. It's yeah. not all like, oh, God, I'm going to die tomorrow or anything like that. But you're definitely aware that, you know, you might have another 20 years, you might have another 30 years. Yeah. But you ain't got, you probably haven't got 50 years, mm. you know. <laughs> so if you want to do something, do it now. You know, don't waste time. Make every moment count, you know. And, um, and, and you've still got the energy. Mm. I think right. uh, I, my take has been it's been it's an incredibly powerful time uh, for me my sort mm. of my break point was at 37 and a half and that was just you know losing a business and just three or four things colliding you know and mm. great overwhelm from great overwhelm came great change for me you know and it's yeah that's but I'm finding that's a common entity where you kind of it also is a point when you get to you know, you, you know, parents, unfortunately, are naturally going to pass at that time just mm. due to the age. Mm. But also it's kind of like better off in terms of what, you know, people thought of you as a child, other people's opinions, where you suddenly shake it all off and go on. I'm close enough to the other side. You know, you're, you're at a midpoint and you yeah. say, right, um, where am I at now? And what everyone else thinks of me is none of my business and I don't care. And I want to do what I want to do. And it's beautifully freeing, I found anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's totally liberating. And it comes, you know, it comes back a bit to what you were saying before around ego, wasn't it? And, you know, I was saying, I think sometimes we worry too much about what other people mm. think of us. And the reality is, as you say, it's, it's no one else, it's not your business what anyone else thinks about you, is it? You know, so don't, and don't sweat the small things. I think when you're young, mm. you get hit up about things, you know, you might be a little bit, something happens at work. And, oh, God, you know, you're really more emotional mm. about it. Whereas I think when you get a bit older, you kind of think, well, I'll pick my battles, you know, I'll pick the things, or not necessarily in an aggressive way, but I'll pick the things yeah. that I'm going to focus energy, time on and get upset about maybe. But there's, there's quite a lot of stuff in it. You know what? Does it really matter in the whole scheme? Just, just let it go, you know? Just, it, honestly, the only person that's going to actually lose is yourself by getting mm. all, you know, emotional about it. So I think you do become a lot more pragmatic. Look at us, how wise we are, Pete. Wow. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. it's something there with with you know for me talking and that's the whole benefit of the podcast is speaking to so many people and you do get to be very wise because people have gone through whatever journey they've gone through um but the closer you live to your values is what i find is the common theme you know that, that when yeah. you're doing what you do you know the old expression of you, you know if you do what you do you never work a day in your life yeah. Again, cliched, but it is true, and that it's it's the path of least resistance because you love it, you do it, you cherish it, and you and you get on. Um, mm. You know, so it's it's amazing, and I think there's an age thing, and I think it's an education thing that actually you, yeah, it's great. It's, it's a lovely place to be, and and you know, even when you're own, you know, you're talking about your own passions, it's you know, it's 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 great. You know, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why can't it be us? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what what do you see in the horizon for you? What's what's coming up that's floats your boat? 
Well, I think for me, it's about sort of growing the businesses, the three businesses I've got, you know, because obviously, uh, you know, the property business is still relatively new for us. Um, so there's a lot to do there. We've got a really clear plan. As, as I said earlier, before we started recording, the shape of it is going to evolve, you know, because the plan's great, isn't it? But it never always plays out exactly right. But the end goal, I'm really confident we'll get to. So that's about growing the, growing the property business to create a significant asset base for ourselves and, and the legacy piece. Um, on the mentoring side of things, yeah, I want to reach more people, help more people. So again, I'm quite specific about the clients that I work with because I think, you know, it needs to be um, the right match. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I don't, I don't just take on anyone. You know, it's got to be right on both sides. So that's great. But to do more of that, ultimately, you know, my long term goal is to really help as many people as possible fulfill their potential in whatever way. And I guess some of that is... I'd not thought of it in this way, but even having a podcast and, and having a forum and a, and a platform to inspire people, I think is great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and yeah, there's the charitable aspect of, of leaving an imprint in this world and, and helping women in particular achieve their potential. So longer term, I would like to be, I suppose, known as being more of a well-rounded businesswoman that's done a lot of good in the world. For other mm. people i mean ultimately i you know i i want i want people to to think that oh yeah jeanette she was a good egg and she really helped me she made a difference in my life and, and kind of helped me push on to the next level um or gave me confidence and support uh, and obviously my nieces and nephews will do very well out of the property side of things when i depart this planet um, unless i spend it all <laughs> before <laughs> then but uh yeah i think that's it more of the same but but kind of leave more of a global impact mm. which i guess means me transitioning to become more of a global brand in a way you know longer term not in an egotistical way but just in terms yeah. of bigger reach yeah no it's um it's always interesting you know with people because different schools of thoughts some people say if you want to you know if you want to help people become rich you know the richer you are the more you can help and it's it's absolutely it's it can be contrary to sort of public perception you know um mm -hmm. people go no no you should help now it's like well actually no like anything the best thing i can do is compound my growth and and you know it, it just depends on your on your thought but just circling back a bit i mean you talked about potential i mean where are you at in terms of reaching yours Oh, I've got more to more to give, more to get to for sure. But I'll always will have. I'll never, I'll, I'll never. Even if if if, you, if we have this conversation, I'm a doddering old lady in my nineties. You'll probably say, "Have you reached your potential?" I'll say, "No, I've still got some to do." Uh, <laughs> um, listen, I think I, I feel very lucky and privileged to have had the life and business experience that I've had because that's in your locker, isn't it? You know, that stays with you, and, it, and it's well grounded of years of experience mistakes learning you know all the stuff that I've done so that is a given that's kind of there in my locker but I think for me to I'm shifting into a different space you know now to where I am is much more entrepreneurial um, and it's much more around how can I apply all of that harder knowledge and experience in the corporate more structured world to the world I'm in now because I don't believe they're mutually exclusive I think there's a great combination that you can bring I can bring to our businesses um, so for me it's probably around you know becoming more entrepreneurial maybe having more adding some extra businesses I'd love to write a book a couple of books I know I've got a couple of books in me um, you know, and that's probably the, the, the brand piece. So I'm shifting into new territories. I mean, if you'd asked me three months ago, would I have been doing, well, four months ago, would I have my own podcast? I'd have laughed. I wasn't planning on doing that. You know, I mean, that's all new. I'm learning how to be, be an interviewer. You know, of course, that's a new skill, isn't it? You know, so I, yeah, no, I've not, not yet reached my potential, Pete. Loads more to come, but I think it's in the entrepreneurial space. It's probably in the mentoring helping and and also on the business side because you know let's face it all industries are going to go through an absolute terrible time let's face it over the next yeah. kind of four or five sure. years it's going to be tough and i think you need strong business leaders that have been through very difficult scenarios you know and so for me i think to to reshape the industry that i know the travel industry into the what the future industry is going to be i'll, I'll be paying a role in that as well yeah. so what's your book going to be about 
I think it will be. I think there's a few in there. I think there's one about probably being a woman in business, actually, and how to sort of navigate <laughs> navigate through that. Um, so I think that's one. But then I think there's there's a more general one, which is which is about your potential around mindset and, and sort of the, the, the tricks and tools that you can put in place to, to remove any blockers and and, uh, and really reach for the moon. Mm. You know, you stars but reach for the moon so i think there's probably a couple of a couple of angles you know as i say it's just a nascent idea at the moment but um you never know it will happen because i've said it now <laughs> yeah that's it small acorns become big trees you know that's it uh, <laughs> that's all yeah what's a what's a guilty pleasure for you oh guilty pleasure hmm well, that's a good question i don't know actually oh i tell you what it is mm, i've got one Dolly Parton. Right. <laughs> Music, yeah. right? The, like, not the cool thing to like Dolly Parton, a bit of country, but my God, I love that woman. If, I, if I, ever I have a, a girl's night or something, we always stick a bit of Dolly on. <laughs> I've seen her in concert a few times. Because what I love about her right, is she is unapologetically herself, right? So mm. you, I sounds a bit strange when you think about Dolly Parton she's got the wig and the makeup and she's had so much work done you think my god she's just this plastic barbie but my god she's a fierce absolutely fierce businesswoman very very smart very very wealthy she plays very well to her kind of you know a bit of a dumb blonde sort of image that she puts out there but do not be fooled it's great fun and the music's just like a laugh isn't it you know so, but it's not the kind of thing that you'd be like, it's not the sort of music I normally like. I'm into like heavy rock bands, you know, like a bit of ACDC, you know, a bit, of, <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know, that's more my bag, um, not Dolly. So that's my guilty pleasure on the music front. Wow, I like it, I like it. What about <laughs> a, a hidden talent that we don't know about? Hidden talent, oh God, I don't know, not actually. I've got any hidden talents? Uh, oh, I'm struggling with that. I am struggling. Oh, I know. I'm quite a good knitter. <laughs> right. What, what's, what's your go-to on knitting? I haven't knitted for years, but I have made a couple of cardigans, a couple of jumpers over the years, yes, which was right. taught by my mum, actually. My mum taught me how to knit. But yeah, I'm probably a bit rusty now, but you wouldn't put me down as a knitter. I'm not your typical sort of knitting kind of image. <laughs> oh, definitely. And, le and leisure and pleasure. Leisure and pleasure. What do you mean mm. in terms of what I like to do? Yeah. Um, sport is a big thing, actually, for, for me. Not in terms of team sports, but more health and fitness and well-being. So if I don't train every day, I, I not I don't feel good. You know, I'll do some running or yoga, or I'll be in the gym or spinning or cycling. So so that is definitely a, that's just a core, a core part of my life if you like so, mm. so definitely that um i've really loved i've got a, a renewed passion for scuba diving over the last few years so i got my paddy and my advanced paddy gosh but i don't know about 15 years ago and then I had a, a bad experience i had a break of about eight years but i've got back into diving now so we've had a couple of really cool we were diving in the maldives actually in march just before COVID and then I did a month in the Philippines diving, all wreck diving and stuff. So getting a bit more adventurous on the diving. So I'm about, I'm at about 55 dives now. And I want to get, you know, I want to get north of a hundred because then I'll go back to the Galapagos and dive in the Galapagos where the currents are really strong. So we, we, we were in the Galapagos when we went traveling around South America, but we didn't dive because I wasn't, didn't feel confident enough. So mm. that is something. Yeah. But just, you know, I, I like, I, I love, Cuddling up on the sofa with Chris with a good movie, bottle of reds, you know, that kind of thing. I love that. I also enjoy going out with friends and family, you know, so I'm, I'm a typical Gemini, actually. I, I, there's two sides to that. Not in a two-faced way, but I think I just, uh, I, I, can see, I can see the enjoyment in both sides of a night in and a night out, you know. <laughs> What's your go-to on the wine and the movie? Oh, well... So the wine would probably be a Rioja. No, actually a Malbec. Malbec used to be a Rioja. I'd probably go for Malbec now. Mm -hmm. In particular, having been to Mendoza in Argentina, which is wonderful, by the way. Uh, so yeah, probably a Malbec, I'd say. And in terms of film, it would be along the lines of a chick flick. It would probably be <laughs> something mm -hmm. like either Eat, Pray, Love, 
great mm -hmm. film. Or Love Actually. I love, oh God, I must have seen those films. Or Notting Hill, that kind of thing. If I was, or Sex in the City, that's also good. So you know, I'd be in that genre of just, you know, silly, you know, trash, really. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> love it. And where for creativity and flow, what what's your what's your sort of mechanism for that? Uh, I like to do. Uh, I'd be I'm at my creative best in the morning, early, okay. mm. early, early. So you know, I tend to be up. Depends if I'm, I'm not while I'm here particularly, but generally if I'm at, at home, I'll be up at sort of five, six. I'm, I am a genuine early bird. And I love that quiet time in the morning, you know, when before the world's woken up and, you know, you still put dew on the grass and all that. I really find that um, very peaceful. It gives me great headspace. And it, also I try and do my most, my most important work then, to yeah. be honest. And I like to exercise in the morning as well. So my mornings tend to be quite full, quite early and quite full. Um, and then in the afternoons, I'll, I'll normally be focused more on phone calls or admin type stuff. But I'll have done most of my big work, if you like, and big thinking, um, you know, probably by about 11, something like that, midday latest. Yeah, so that's my best. Wow. And in terms of favourite meal then? Oh, favourite meal. Oh, it's got to be pasta. I know I'm a bit of a carb freak. I know you shouldn't be. But yeah, yeah, mm. I'd, I'd say probably Italian. Chris does a great Mediterranean chicken, which is delicious with tagliatelle. So that's 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 pretty cool. But yeah, Indian, yeah, either, either Italian or Indian. I spend a lot of time in India, so fish curry, rice and dal, would be up there as well. Oh wow, love it! You're making me <laughs> hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of last questions, really. What's something that you're super proud of? I'm. Something or someone, something, something. Whatever way you want to choose the question. Okay, I'm, no, I'm really, su I am super proud of, I think I'm definitely super proud of what I've achieved in my career. Uh, not just because I fulfilled my own dreams, if you like, and potential, but also because even now, years later, I still get messages of people who were on my team or that I helped through that period that say, say to me, you really made a difference to me. Either I was a role model for them or I, I helped them out or I you know, gave them some advice. So I think the, in terms of the impact and, and you know, if you think from where I came from you know, in my early life to becoming the CEO, mm. I think that's probably, that journey was 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 one enjoyable but something that i rightly should rightly should feel proud of to be honest yeah that's probably the big one and then you 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 had that in two parts what was the other part oh so the first one was around me personally in terms yeah. of what i achieved and where i got to and then the second part is the fact that i feel i have genuinely helped hundreds of people right. with Perfect. their careers and and get them into hmm. you know, better places and even now I, I still get messages of people saying you know mm. I worked with Jeanette back in 1995 and you know that kind of thing it's, it's lovely beautiful. isn't it it's nice yeah so tell me what does fire in the belly mean to you then what what is your fire in the belly specifically my fire in the belly is it's all about making sure you've got no regrets, making sure I have no regrets and that I am absolutely living up to my potential. And that shifts, that bar shifts. You know, you don't just get there and go, I'm done. Well, I don't anyway. Um, so for me, fire in the belly is, is absolutely living your dreams, taking the action, no regrets, giving it a go and leaving an impact, a positive impact on this world helping other people for me it's it's all wrapped up into that but be true to yourself you know don't no one's going to do it for you this is mm. your this is my journey my life so make it count because it's short yeah. I, love that. I love that saying from your parents it was you know let's make great memories which things yeah. is, is a beautiful beautiful mantra yeah yeah absolutely so tell us Jeanette how can people follow you reach out to you Track you down, hunt you down, listen to you. <laughs> I 
everywhere, really, everywhere, Pete. So uh, I'm on social media, so you'll find me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And I've got a YouTube channel, Jeanette Limfoots, where um, all my videos and stuff are saved. I've got the podcast, Brave, Bold, Brilliant Podcast, and you'll find that on all the usual platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts. I have a website as well, www.JeanetteLinfootsAssociates.com. So yeah, you can, you can find me anywhere. Feel free to reach out, message me, have a chat, all great. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you for being so open and sharing. It's, it's, uh, it's great to hear it and so many exciting things ahead. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Pete. It's been wonderful.